Okay, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, last session of uh, the day and also of the workshop. Uh, so we are very happy to start this final session uh, with uh, Robin Neumeyer from Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, Robin is gonna talk to us about quantitative Faber-Cran inequalities. And uh, well, please uh, Robin, take it away. All right, uh, thanks very much for the introduction and thanks to the organizers for putting on a, a very nice workshop and for inviting me to take part in it. Um, yes, I, I wish I could be there in person. It's It's been a very interesting week for me watching these talks. I come from a bit of a different community than a lot of the, the people associated with this workshop, but uh, it's been quite interesting to, to watch the talks. Um, so, Today, I want to talk about some joint work with my collaborators, Mark Allen at Brigham Young University and Dennis Kravensov at Rutgers. Um, and okay, as I mentioned, I, I come from a little bit different of a community, so I'm not really speaking about things directly related to the topic of the workshop, but I'll be talking about uh, quantitative, oh, quantitative estimates for Faber-Cron inequalities as well as some applications to a certain monotonicity formula used in free boundary problems. So my hope here is uh, that I maybe can communicate some of the main themes of, of this line of work, um, which I think maybe under the surface also have some connections to, to the broader themes of the workshop. So I, I guess also I, I should say, please have no hesitation about stopping and interrupting me along the way to ask questions as they arise. So uh, the Faber-Cron inequality in the plane in R2 says the following physically, says if you consider drum heads of a fixed area, so if you have some fixed amount of animal hide or whatever synthetic material and you're building a drum, then of all possible shapes, a circular drum head is the one that's going to produce the vibration of lowest frequency. So a little bit more mathematically and more generally, the Faber-Cron inequality uh, involves the following. So, so when I say the frequency of lower, lowest vibration, uh, we define this in the following way. So take some bounded open subset, omega, of Euclidean space of any dimension or more generally in a Romanian manifold, then the principal frequency or the first eigenvalue of the Dirichlet Laplacian is defined, well, we'll denote it by lambda one of omega, and it's given by minimizing the Dirichlet energy among functions that vanish on the boundary of omega and that are normalized to have L2 norm equal to one. So this infimum is achieved, and it's achieved by a function u omega, which is the corresponding first eigenfunction of the Laplacian with Dirichlet boundary data. Okay, so some basic properties. So this is an eigenfunction in the sense that it solves the following eigenvalue equation for the Laplacian. This minimizer u omega solves minus Laplace u equals lambda one times u omega in the domain, where again, this is the first eigenvalue, that's the minimum value, with the Dirichlet boundary conditions. So if, if you have some reasonably nice domain, for example, if your domain is connected, so this is a sufficient but not necessary, then this function is going to be strictly positive in the interior of the domain and will also be unique. And what the Faber-Cron inequality says then in this more general setting, is that if you take any bounded and open subset of Euclidean space, then the first eigenvalue of omega is greater than or equal to the first eigenvalue of the corresponding ball of the same volume as omega. And in fact, equality holds here if and only if omega is some translation of this ball. And this is up to a set of capacity zero. So let me make a comment here. The, the same exact inequality holds for subsets of the round sphere and of hyperbolic space. So here in those settings, when we say ball, we mean geodesic ball or a ball with respect to the geodesic distance. Uh, 
in all of these cases, the Faber-Cron inequality or the minimality of balls here for the first eigenvalue is just a consequence of the fact that balls are isoparametric sets for every volume. So the main question that I'm interested in today is that of stability for the Faber-Cron inequality. So I wanna ask the following question. Suppose I have some domain omega and the first eigenvalue is equal to that of a ball of the same volume plus a little bit, plus epsilon. Then two things, is omega close to a ball in some geometrically meaningful sense? And similarly, is its corresponding first eigenvalue, eigenfunction close to that of a ball? And I wanna understand this in a quantitative sense. So uh, this type of result, so before I even get into the results, let's think about two different ways to interpret this sort of quantitative stability result for, for a geometric inequality like the Faber-Cron inequality. So the first interpretation is you can think you've started at the ground state, you've started at the ball and you inject epsilon amount of energy into, into this set. In this case, the energy is the first Dirichlet eigenvalue. Uh, then if you've, in, if you've perturbed the energy by epsilon, what we hope to show is some sort of quantitative estimate that says, then this corresponding set is perturbed at most by some modulus of continuity involving epsilon, epsilon to some power alpha, in fact, uh, both in terms of the symmetric difference between omega and the closest ball. So this shaded blue region, the volume of the symmetric difference, and also a distance that measures the difference between the first eigenfunction of a ball, which is some radially symmetric function, and that on this domain. Another way that you can read a quantitative stability result of this type is as a statement about the energy profile of the first eigenvalue functional, as a functional on sets. So uh, you can think if we, here I've, from the previous slide, replaced uh, epsilon by epsilon to the one over alpha. If we prove a statement like, whenever the first eigenvalue is equal to that of the ball plus one over, or epsilon to the one over alpha, implies the distance between omega and the ball, the nearest ball is of order epsilon. We can think of this in the following way. Here in the schematic picture I've drawn in this two-dimensional axis, the infinite dimensional space of subsets of Rn normalized to have volume, say, one. And along this axis, I've drawn the class of minimizers, that is translations of balls. So we can identify this really with Euclidean space, just every point of where this ball is centered. Uh, so a statement like this, a quantitative stability estimate like this, gives a modulus of growth of the energy of the first eigenvalue away from this class of minimizers. It says the energy grows at least like, uh, like epsilon or distance to the alpha. Okay, so, uh, so a little bit more generally, not just focused on the Faber-Cron inequality, but uh, a lot of my research program focuses on quantitative stability estimates in various different kinds of geometric and functional inequalities. And people study these things because they're useful. Uh, they're, they're interesting from the viewpoint of the calculus variations, but they, they also end up being quite useful in various different applications in different parts of mathematics. So let me share with you a couple of general motivations and applications for quantitative stability estimates for functional and geometric inequalities more broadly. Uh, and then later in this talk, we'll talk about a specific application of the new Faber-Cron stability results that we'll prove. So one nice type of application of quantitative stability estimates uh, comes in understanding ground states or energy minimizers for complicated energy functionals. So in some cases, like, for the first Dirichlet eigenvalue, simple symmetrization arguments will tell us that balls are minimizers. But uh, sometimes the situation is much more complicated. A nice example of this comes from work of Knupfer and Muratov in 2014, 
where they studied the liquid drop model coming from nuclear physics, which describes the, the equilibrium shape of atomic nuclei. And here they used a quantitative stability result for the isoparametric inequality, the isoparametric problem, in order to prove that balls are the unique energy minimizers for small mass in this liquid drop model. So stability was a tool to characterize energy minimizers. So another nice type of application uh, comes in the form of using stability estimates to give effective approximations for variational problems. So an example here comes from uh, a paper of Garcia, Trios, Murray, and Thorpe. Uh, the first author gave a very nice talk here earlier this week. Uh, and in this paper, the authors consider a clustering method for finite data sets sampled from distributions on, on some continuous domain, on some continuous uh, Romanian manifold. And here they apply a recent quantitative stability estimate for the isoparametric problem here on Romanian manifolds in order to prove high probability convergence rates for clusters formed from uh, finite data sets as the number of, of sampled points tends to infinity. Okay, and in another type of application of quantitative stability estimates that I'll mention uh, comes in the form of rates of convergence in parabolic flows. So here a nice example is work of Carlin and Figali, where they use, they, they prove some new quantitative stability estimates for a Sobolev type uh, energy, uh, for Galliardo Nirenberg Sobolev inequalities. And they apply this to establish convergence rates for the Keller-Siegel equation, an equation that models population density for bacteria over time. Okay, so, uh, so all in all, these kind of quantitative stability estimates are, are useful in various settings. And like I mentioned, at the, in the latter part of this talk, we'll see uh, an application of the results that I'm going to talk about. Okay, but so let's, let's return to the Faber-Kron inequality. Mm. So in 2015, there was a, a very nice quantitative stability estimate that was proven for the Faber-Kron inequality. Uh, it's due to Brasco, De Filippis, and Velichkov. And it says the following. It says, if you take any domain, omega, in Euclidean space, it's open and bounded, then if the first eigenvalue is equal to the first eigenvalue of a ball of the same volume plus epsilon, then the volume of the symmetric difference, again, that's this shaded area, the volume of this blue shaded area, the points in one set but not the other, it's at most of order epsilon to the power one half. Uh, and this power one half, in fact, is, is optimal. So in terms of this uh, energy profile picture, this corresponds to quadratic energy growth away from the class of minimizers, away from balls. Uh, so, so this is a very nice result. There's one drawback here, which is the following. Uh, this comes from the small distinction that uh, the Faber-Kron inequality, or rather the first eigenvalue more generally, detects uh, changes in sets up to sets of capacity zero. Whereas uh, this volume of the symmetric difference, it detects uh, changes up to sets of Lebesgue measure zero. And so in this way, uh, from their estimate, you might have uh, epsilon positive. That is to say, you might have some set with uh, first eigenvalue strictly bigger than that of the ball of the same volume, but its symmetric difference uh, is the same, uh, or the symmetric difference with the ball is equal to zero. So a nice example of this would be a slit domain. You take a ball in any dimension and you cut out uh, a, a lower, a one a hyperplane. You cut out a hyperplane uh, or half a hyperplane from, from this set, the resulting domain omega is going to have strictly larger first eigenvalue, okay? So, so we see then this quantitative stability estimate is, uh, although it's, it's sharp in this optimal power, 
we're sort of not detecting the right types of, uh, the right size of modifications of sets with respect to this sort of distance. So just a side remark here, in this kind of example or any example in which uh, you modify your domain or you take a ball and you modify it so that the first eigenvalue is strictly bigger than that of the ball, then the difference between the corresponding first eigenfunction and that of the ball in L2 is strictly positive. So the, the, sort of, the main result that I wanna share with you today then is the following. So as I mentioned, this is joint work with Alan and Kravensov uh, from this past summer. And we show the following. So take a bounded open subset of Euclidean space as before or hyperbolic space or the round sphere. So any space, simply connected space forms. Suppose, you have, suppose that this set has first eigenvalue that is equal to the first eigenvalue of the ball of the same volume plus epsilon, then the difference between their corresponding eigenfunctions uh, in L2 plus the volume of their symmetric difference is at most of order epsilon to the power one half. So here on, on any of these space forms, we're controlling, again, the size of this symmetric difference, this blue shaded area, but also the L2 difference between eigenfunctions on these domains. Okay, and once again, uh, this rate, this, this power epsilon to the power one half is, is optimal. It cannot be replaced by any larger exponent. Okay, so, uh, so with respect to, oh geez. Okay, well, I really scrolled. Okay, so with respect to this previous- just, uh, Hi, Robin. Yes, you uh, just. So just a clarification question. So how do you, uh, given that these two functions are eigenfunctions are defined on different domains, how do you compare them in L2? You extend by zero? Extend by zero, yes. So Thanks. yes, thank you. So here we're using the fact that these have Dirichlet boundary data. So exactly, just extend them by zero. And then this integral is taken over the entire space, say M, whether this, this manifold M is Euclidean space, hyperbolic space, or the round sphere. Yeah. While we're here, any, any further questions before I carry on? Okay, so um, so just to, to mention, so, so there are two new features of this result relative to the one of Brosco de Filippis and uh, Velichkov that I mentioned before. The first is that this quantitative estimate gives control of the eigenfunction difference between these two domains, excuse me, and also we extend this result to the sphere and hyperbolic space, where this is the first quantitative stability result of any sort, at least that holds in the generality of, of all sets. There were some results of Avila uh, from the early 2000s involving convex, so stability estimates among convex sets uh, of these spaces. But so both of these two generalizations were not just for fun, let's say. Uh, they were both kind of crucial in the application that we had in mind to this monotonicity formula in the study of free boundary problems. So I want to say a couple of words about the proof of this quantitative stability estimate, hopefully uh, in a direction that might be of interest to, to some people in this crowd. So the basic proof scheme, uh, which is sort of the go-to proof strategy for quantitative stability estimates in the setting of geometric inequalities is a technique known as the selection principle. So this was something introduced by Cicalese and Leonardi in the context of the isoparametric inequality in 2012. And this scheme has two steps. So the first step is a local analysis. And this is the portion of the proof that I'll say actually a couple of, of details about. So here you wanna prove this desired quantitative stability estimate among small smooth perturbations of the ball. 
And this second step then, which I won't say anything further about, is a reduction step. It says, okay, in order to prove quantitative stability for all bounded open sets, it actually suffices to prove it for those local perturbations. And this step is always based in regularity theory for, for minimizers of some carefully constructed functional related to the main one. So, so in this case, a, a certain perturbation of the first eigenvalue functional. But so I'd like to share some details about this local analysis step. So more specifically, what this step entails is the following. Suppose you have some set omega and you know that the boundary of omega is a small C2 alpha graph over the boundary of the ball, okay? So, so here I've got some ball in red and we suppose that our set omega looks like this. So it's, uh, it's just a, a smooth, its boundary is a smooth perturbation of the boundary of the ball. This is a ball that has the same volume as omega. And moreover, we have translated these so that the barycenter of omega is equal to the barycenter of the ball, okay? So here I've drawn a Euclidean space picture. If you wanna keep in mind that, that we're also proving this on the sphere and on hyperbolic space, here's a, an analogous picture on the sphere. Now our balls are spherical caps. And again, we're considering a function omega whose, whose boundary is a small perturbation. The goal now is to prove the quantitative stability estimate we want just for this class of sets. So I want to show, okay, if omega is like this, then if I know the first eigenvalue is that of the ball plus a little bit plus epsilon, then the L2 distant difference between my eigenfunctions and plus the symmetric difference between omega and the ball is at most of order epsilon to the power one half. So the key point here is that uh, you're able to write all of the relevant geometric quantities in terms of the parameterizing function. So, so we assumed that the boundary of omega is a small C2 alpha graph. Let me call the, on the, on the boundary of the ball, let me call this function psi, okay? So boundary of omega is given by one plus psi of x pushing in the x direction, that's the normal direction, for x on the boundary of the ball. So here then psi is a function on the boundary of the ball with small C2 alpha norm. So my entire, uh, every, everything, my, my first eigen, well, let's start with, the, yeah, the first eigenvalue of omega, I'm able to write this in terms of my parameterizing function C. So let me go ahead and do a Taylor expansion of this quantity. So at order zero, my Taylor expansion is just going to give me the first eigenvalue of the ball. At first order, I get the first variation, whatever it is. At second order, I get the second variation, whatever it is, plus higher order terms. So the, the ball is a minimizer of the first eigenvalue. So in particular, it's a critical point. And so this first order term, is going to vanish. This first variation is going to be zero. And so the gap between my first eigenvalues, lambda one omega minus lambda one of the ball, up to higher order terms, is just the second variation of the first eigenvalue at a ball in the direction xi xi. That's what I have in my second order of the Taylor expansion. So really the key point now is to show that the second variation uh, of the first eigenvalue of the ball in directions C, C controls the H one half norm of this parameterizing function C squared, okay? From there, it's not so hard to show that this H one half norm squared controls the two geometric quantities that we wanna control, the distance between eigenfunctions and the symmetric difference between the sets, okay? So, so let me say a word or two about uh, this key estimate, which I've called star. So I wanna show the second variation. I wanna show some, some quantitative stability at the level of the second variation. So we want to do a, a spectral analysis here. I, uh, and okay, so, so, so the idea is let's write down this second variation 
it's a uh, given by the integral over the boundary of a ball of xi times l of xi, where l is the the differential operator that I get in the second variation. So it's a first order non-local operator. It's a bit nasty, but you can write it down. So it, it's also a uh, an operator with a discrete spectrum, and so we can write down the uh, this expression in terms of the L2 basis of the eigenfunctions of this operator L. So I write this as the sum from k equals zero to infinity of beta i, these are the eigenvalues of this operator L, times a i squared. These are the Fourier coefficients, okay, the, the coefficients for this expansion uh, in this L2 basis. So there are a couple of things I can compute explicitly from the volume constraint, so the fact that my set omega has the same volume as, as a ball, uh, this coefficient corresponding to my zeroth eigenvalue is, and in fact, that it's an eigenvalue with, uh, with value zero, this corresponding uh, coefficient is going to be equal to zero. Uh, moreover, the fact that I've fixed my Berry center is going to tell me explicitly that these first, these next n coefficients in my uh, Fourier expansion are also equal to zero. Okay? This function C parameterizing my boundary is orthogonal to translations, which are in the next eigenspace. And so really what this means is that my, my second variation is given by the sum from k equals n plus one to infinity of my corresponding eigenvalues times the Fourier coefficients squared. And so here's a, so, so it's at this point that we want to find a gap in the spectrum of this operator L. Hey, we would like to say that uh, the next eigenvalue, so the first eigenvalue that's appearing in this expansion is actually strictly positive unlike the, the eigenvalues corresponding to volume and to dilations and translations, okay? And so in the case on Euclidean space, you're actually able to appeal to explicit formulas uh, that tell you that this next eigenvalue of your second variation operator is going to be something strictly positive, okay? From which point you can say, okay, your second variation is equal to this sum from n plus one to infinity of beta i alpha i squared, which is bounded from below by some uniform constant times the L2 norm of your function. Okay, we really wanted to control the H1 norm squared, but uh, it's just a small trick to, to upgrade from there. The problem is that on the sphere and on hyperbolic space, these explicit formulas aren't available. So in fact, on on these space forms, unlike in Euclidean space, we don't even have a closed form expression for the first eigenvalue of a spherical, of a, of a geodesic ball. So for example, a spherical cap on the sphere. So in order to find this spectral gap at the, the appropriate place that says, if our parameterizing function is orthogonal to dilations and translations, then the next eigenvalue comes with a strictly bigger eigenfunction, or eigenfunction comes with a strictly bigger eigenvalue, uh, we use a, a method that we introduced that we were calling it a, an implicit spectral analysis. So the idea here is that we use the maximum principle in order to deduce the existence of a spectral gap in this operator whose spectrum we can't get an explicit handle on. So the basic idea here is that using the symmetry of our minimizers, balls, we know that all of the eigenfunctions of this second variation operator are spherical harmonics. They're eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the boundary of the ball. So those eigenvalues, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian for these guys are explicitly known. What we don't know explicitly are the eigenvalues of this operator L uh, corresponding to each of these eigenfunctions. Uh, the 
the eigenvalue is determined by the, the uh, derivative of a solution to a certain ODE, okay? So the ith eigenvalue of L is given by uh, the up to a constant, the derivative of this function fi at one, where f is a function on the interval zero one, solving an ODE, okay, second order ODE, whose explicit form is not so important. The only thing I wanna point out is that it involves the corresponding eigenvalue of uh, for the Laplacian on the sphere, something that's explicit. And so, although we're not able to actually compute what these eigenvalues are, um, we're able to use a maximum principle argument, uh, comparing solutions of these two ODE, of the, of the ODEs for varying values of the eigenvalue of the Laplacian on the sphere. And basically deduce that whenever you have a, spec a gap in the spectrum for the Laplacian on the sphere, there's a, also a gap in the spectrum for this operator L. Okay, so in particular, uh, for the first, for I running from one up to N, the eigenvalues of the, the eigenvalues of the Laplacian, or the, so the spherical, the spherical harmonics, they correspond to translations. The eigenvalues are the same for each of those. And so the corresponding eigenvalues in the context of our operator L are also the same. In fact, they're equal to zero. But when you take the next eigenvalue, so we are when, you, when you take the next I, uh, you get a gap in the spectrum for the spherical harmonics. And so then using the maximum principle, comparing these two ODE solutions, you in fact get a gap in the spectrum in the corresponding operator L. Okay, and so, so in this way, we're able to conclude uh, the quantitative stability estimate among sets that are small perturbations of, of balls. Okay, so um, let me say one or two words just in the last uh, couple of minutes about the main application of this result. So the context that we're interested in is uh, something called the alt caffarelli friedman monotonicity formula. So this is a monotonicity formula that's really important in the study of certain free boundary problems, like the obstacle problem and uh, two-phase free boundary problems. Really, it's the fact, though, about pairs of non-negative subharmonic functions. So the basic setup here is that uh, you take any two functions, u, uh, v1 and v2, that are non-negative, and are subharmonic in their supports. So VI is subharmonic where it's strictly positive. And the supports of these two functions are disjoint. Okay? And let's suppose that the origin is in the intersect in the boundary of both of their positive, the, the boundary of their positivity sets. Okay. So kind of situations you can have in mind would be if V1 and V2 are both just truncated linear functions. So a linear function here, a linear function of possibly a different slope over here, uh, meeting at a hyperplane interface. So this is somehow the model situation. Um, but more generally, you can have uh, other sort of configurations. You can have an interface between these two domains that's like a cone and say V1 and V2 are the corresponding harmonic functions that vanish on the boundary of these two domains. Or you can have really nasty behaved uh, domains, omega one and omega two, and really whatever subharmonic functions you want uh, on those two domains. So, so there's no real assumption of, of, well, there's no assumption of the regularity of the interface or, or niceness of these functions. Uh, and what the, this monotonicity formula says, though, is for any pair of such functions, consider the following uh, formula, J of R. So, so R here is a scaling parameter. It takes a slightly different form in higher dimensions. 
Uh, but in two dimensions, this monotonicity formula is simply the average of the Dirichlet energy of V1 over a ball of radius R times the average of the Dirichlet energy of a ball uh, of, of V2 on a ball of radius R. And what this, mo what this monotonicity formula says is that this thing is monotone. It's strictly decreasing as R, well, it's decreasing as R tends to zero, or in other words, it's increasing as a function of R. And moreover, there's a rigidity associated to this. Uh, if, so if the limit of this monotonicity formula as you tend to zero is positive, then your monotonicity formula is constant if and only if you're in this model situation of two, uh, two truncated uh, linear solutions. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, let me just uh, go quickly to, to the point. Uh, we, we apply, maybe, maybe I'll just draw, draw a picture. We apply our main quantitative, so the main application of this quantitative stability estimate for the faber cron inequality is the following. We give a condition in terms of this monotonicity formula enabled in order to ensure that uh, a pair of subharmonic functions like we had before have unique, have unique blow up. So if you start, okay, something's going wrong with my pencil. Um, so if you start to rescale these functions in the following way, so if you just start zooming in and rescaling these functions in a Lipschitz manner, we give a, an optimal condition in terms of this monotonicity formula to tell you that these guys are going to blow up to a unique, have a unique uh, blow up to two linear functions with a hyperplane tangent, a hyperplane interface. So in particular, this gives you a condition guaranteeing a tangent plane for the interface at zero at the origin between these two uh, subharmonic functions. Okay, so anyway, uh, I, am, I am out of time. So thanks very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Robin. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, so thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And in fact, I have two short questions. Um, the first one is, um, is there any hope that you can get a statement on the Hausdorff distance between the set and the ball? Or could, the, could there be situations where the, the set has um, very large spikes with small measure? And, and the second question is, can you, is there any hope or do you have any ideas how to translate your results to nonlinear differential operators, for instance, studying the minimal eigenvalue of the P-Laplacian operator? Okay, two nice questions. Okay, so so the first question about could this be upgraded to Hausdorff distance? The answer there is no. So so you can construct examples uh, where you take so so we should go in dimension. Oh boy, I'm having so in dimension higher than two. Let's take a a ball say an R3, you can add on some sort of thin tentacles in, uh, in a way, and you can make explicit constructions where the first eigenvalue, of course it will, will grow, but only a small amount. Whereas you can make the Hausdorff distance, then by, by taking this, say, this neck to be very skinny, you can, take, you can make the Hausdorff distance between your set omega and the nearest ball arbitrarily large, uh, while keeping the, the first eigenvalue very close to that of a ball. Now, okay, thank you. Yeah. for the second question, actually, um, yes, for, okay. So, so for something like the first eigenvalue of the P Laplacian, uh, you do have a similar type of uh, Faber-Cron type inequality that, that will say that you're, I don't know how to denote this, the first eigenvalue of the peel Laplacian, which, okay, it is just, just given by the minimization of the Rayleigh quotient, uh, is again minimized by a ball. 
And there's, so in ter- on just Euclidean space and just for the symmetric difference, there's a stability result here that is due to uh, Fusco and Zhang. Where in on Euclidean space, they show that this gap in the peel plus eigenvalues uh, controls the symmetric difference of omega to the nearest ball. Now, so, so that's to say they add an error term that's like C plus symmetric difference okay, to the nearest ball of omega squared. So using our techniques, I think that this result could be also generalized to the sphere or hyperbolic space. Now, in terms of controlling the difference between the eigenfunctions, this is something that uh, it's for in the portion of the, the sort of step two, the regularity step that I didn't discuss at all. Uh, it already becomes quite so the, the regularity theory becomes quite delicate because of the because we're trying to control the eigenvalue, the eigenfunction difference. Um, running the same kind of, so, so trying to establish then the same type of regularity estimates where essentially you, you would have a, a P Laplacian replacing the Laplacian here and there. Okay, would be, it would be significantly more difficult. So, so I'm not sure about that. But I do think, uh, so, so generalizing this results to the sphere and hyperbolic space would be quite manageable uh, using our techniques. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, so, sorry if I missed it, but what's the tight example for your inequality, the, the refined one? Ah, also, if you, if you take uh, if you take a uh, sequence of of like small small ellipsoidal perturbations of okay, well, I don't know what's if you take take the ball and just kind of perturb it. So take a sequence of ellipsoids, uh, just with with eccentricity like one plus epsilon, and let epsilon tend to zero, then. The here, uh, these guys are going to be sharp in the inequality. So, so these will exactly uh, separate, the energy separates exactly quadratically with respect to this distance. And in the likewise also, I mean, so, so here it's kind of a Euclidean picture, but also on the sphere and hyperbolic space, essentially if you take ellipsoidal perturbations of, the ge- of geodesic balls, you can do this in coordinates uh, and find the same that this this is sharp. Uh, okay, are there any questions from our virtual participants, perhaps? Any questions here in the auditorium? Yes, there's another question. Thank you. Uh, so I have a rather naive question. Um, I feel like in the sampling community, I'm more familiar with the sampling, uh, sorry, with um, Poincaré inequality. So I wonder if there is some, uh, like, what well, has a connection with the Poincaré inequality here, which is also like a spectral gap, but for different um, set of functions? Wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? So uh, what are the link between this uh, uh, inequality, the power with the Poincaré inequality? Like, how ah. does it- Really. Okay, so so the punker, so the first, let's see, maybe there, there are two connections and, and so there are diff- different eigenvalues at different levels that I was discussing in the talk. So so the most basic connection is, okay, so 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 given your a domain omega, say bounded and open, uh, we defined its first Dirichlet eigenvalue. This is the Poincaré constant for uh, the Dirichlet boundary conditions. So that's to say for any function u in H1 
zero omega, so that vanishes on the boundary, the gradient u squared is greater than or equal to this Poincaré constant times u squared. Um, so, so in this way, what the Faber-Cron inequality says is that among sets of a fixed domain, balls have the smallest Poincaré constant for the Dirichlet for Dirichlet conditions. Um, now within the proof, so so the within the proof we also so this was maybe connection one. Within the proof, we established this. Uh, we established the existence of a spectral gap for this second variation operator. Uh, and so this gives rise to then the following uh, Poincaré inequality for functions defined on the boundary of the ball. So, so in the proof, we show that for a function, I'm gonna use the same notation just, so if we have some function xi in, in h one half of, let's, okay, let's find, let's just say h one of the boundary of the ball, then, and uh, if xi is orthogonal in L2 to translations, Okay, meaning so if C integrates to zero, and if at least let me write this in Euclidean space, if C integrated against coordinate functions is zero on the boundary of the ball, then it satisfies the following Poincaré inequality for involving the so it satisfies C L C is greater than or equal to a constant times the h one half norm of C, where this is, so this is like a first order, so it, this is like a first order quantity. Um, so it's somehow an indirect sort of Poincaré inequality, if you like. I mean, and so, so maybe, maybe this looks more like a Poincaré inequality if we simply put L2 here. And so this is some kind of, uh, this is, so this is morally like, uh, uh, half derivative integrated and squared. So this is morally a sort of H one half norm type of quantity because I say that because this is a first order operator applied to xi times xi. So if you think you integrate half the derivative by parts, then this is like a, a squared norm of, of a half derivative. Okay, does, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, so in the interest of time, we can conclude here. So thank you very much, uh, Robin, again, for, for this very nice talk. And uh, let's have a five-minute break, and then we can continue our program. Thank you.